Hello again, welcome back to Ted's Notebook in the F1 Shutdown, the program that's never so much as driven north of the Holloway Road. How are you doing? All right, good. I thought you could join me on my evening stroll and we could go through some of the uh, F1 news of the week. Um, I've succumbed to it. I've had the, I've had the lockdown haircut. And if you can notice, the wife did it, Kate did it. Um, and she's done a marvelous job. Uh, number four on the sides. Um, has taken a bit of a chunk out of a bit there where we got a bit too keen with the clippers and a comb there. But um, otherwise, yep, I've had the, uh, the lockdown haircut. But where should we begin? I'll tell you what, we'll do all the teams. We'll begin at uh, the world champions uh, Mercedes, shall we? But um, we'll do all the teams and then we'll look at some of the, uh, the news that's come out uh, this week in regards as changing some of the rules and looking at the framework of Formula One for the future and make it more sustainable and more competitive with the new rules that are going to be confirmed by the FIA's World Motorsport Council later this week. But an important week for all the UK teams, um, including Mercedes, because it seems to be the last week of the shutdown. Depending on how far into June we get, um, we're ending the 63 days since they shut down in late March now. So this last week of May, sort of uh, what would be a half term week of May is the last week. And then in June, they all start going back uh, to the factories. The engine factories are already back, as I said, in the last notebook. So Mercedes are getting ready and it's really still the drivers that everybody is looking at because Lewis Hamilton uh, still, um, it seems, in his house uh, in LA. Valtteri Bottas and hasn't re-signed for 2021. Valtteri Bottas hasn't re-signed also for 2021 and still the rumours start that Sebastian Vettel is on Mercedes radar. Yes, that one again is on Mercedes radar for 2021. Not this year, but for next year. And to that part, Bottas is already, the rumours are coming out that he's already talking to Red Bull, he's talking to Renault or his management are at least. He can deny it. He has deniability. His manager Didier Cotton and his manager also is Toto Wolf. Let's not forget. Well, Toto Wolf has an interest, I think, in, in Bottas's career still, but um, uh, as he has since he started. But it's difficult for, for Bottas because he obviously wants to stay at Mercedes, but he needs to protect his position. So um, uh, is he a little bit worried about it? I don't think so. I think he wants to stay and I think they probably want to keep him as choice number one. But that's the, that's the background behind those Bottas to anywhere you want rumours, whether it's uh, Red Bull or whether it's Renault, so anything like that. Um, what else has been going on? Uh, yeah, well, is Sebastian Vettel a Lewis Hamilton leaving insurance policy? That's the other question, of course. I'll just keep my two metres distance. There we go. Um, had Seb known that maybe he's going to part ways with Ferrari, had he looked at Mercedes as, or Mercedes had looked at Seb as an insurance policy if Lewis Hamilton leaves and they need a number one driver and with the best will in the world, they don't want to go into battle with George Russell and Valtteri Bottas, but they'd feel a bit more comfortable if they had Sebastian Vettel on board in terms of going and challenging world championships because they don't want Fernando Alonso, not after what happened with Mercedes at McLaren. So that's another way of looking at Seb at Mercedes. And if he doesn't drive in 2021, could he join Mercedes as an ambassadorial, in an ambassadorial role and as a driver development and a kind of a development driver for Mercedes? That's also possible. Uh, so something that uh, has cropped up uh, recently. But um, uh, what else have uh, Mercedes been doing? Oh yeah, they put a good, uh, good couple of videos up on their, uh, on their YouTube channel. One with the two uh, engineers, one with Andrew Shovelin talking about um, vehicle dynamics, explaining what that is. And one in conversation with their two race engineers, uh, Peter Bono Bonington and Ricardo Ricky Musconi. Is it Musconi or Muscone? Muscone was the uh, guy around the Bail Bonds in Midnight Run, wasn't it? Musco and Bail Bonds. Don't think it's that. I think it's probably Musconi. Anyway, um, and there's quite a few interesting things on there. Firstly, uh, well, I'll, I'll get on something that Shove said about DAS, the uh, dual axis steering, that I thought was particularly interesting. And um, but something uh, we have a, a, a reason as to why Peter Bonington calls it Hammer Time. Um, I hadn't heard this story before. I thought it was because it's Lewis Hamilton and you've got to put the hammer down and it's hammer time. But why does he say it? Well, it goes back to that rule. Do you remember that insane rule that um, the FIA put out, started, uh, when they thought the drivers were being coached too much on the team radio? And they said that there are only a few things that you can say on the team radio. It lasted like half a year. It was absurd. So we got all these codes and stuff going on. Well, that was it. That was the code that Peter Bonington used to tell Lewis Hamilton. 
it's time to go for it now because it seemed like the rules said that you couldn't say that because that would be driver coaching uh, but it's time to go now this is what to do it's hammer time so that is where hammer time comes from which uh, i thought was uh, was quite interesting um they also talked about why they have the central console uh, in the middle of the Mercedes garage. And bear in mind that not other teams, not a lot of other teams, well, a lot of, some teams do. Red Bull don't do this, but um, it's because it was too noisy for the engineers on the pit wall in the V8 eras. Oh, the noisy V8 eras, we'll get onto that in a sec. Um, and, uh, and they felt that they wanted a little bit more of a quiet space. So they moved into the middle of the garage and then they thought it was good because all the engineers from each side of the car, from each car could see each other. They could see their body language as well. And Toto Wolf was in the middle, the all-powerful central command position. And they stuck with it in that because of that. Red Bull don't. Red Bull are always on the pit wall. Both the engineers are. Uh, and they don't have a central console in the middle. Well, they do a small one, but it's uh, the Honda engineer and um, Paul Monaghan, the sort of chief engineer, are, are, are in the centre. So Red Bull seemingly don't mind the noise, or now that it's quieter, don't see that that's quite as much of a factor. But that was one interesting thing from that. Um, the engineers, uh, Bono and Ricky, were talking about all the departments of people, the other people that they have in their ears, and uh, one called the reliability department uh, and strategy department. I thought that must be great to be in the reliability department. It's like it's all or nothing on that. It's all, yeah, yeah, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. You got a problem he's only going to last six more laps and then it all gets dr very dramatic so uh, uh one for uh, people who either like life very quietly or suddenly very panicky the reliability department in the middle of a race that sort of tickled me um what else were they saying uh oh yeah they were talking about um the das right so andrew shovlin was talking about this now bear in mind that the dual axis steering you remember the trombone steering that the drivers can sort of press a button unlock and then it moves, the steering wheel moves in and out, and that adjusts the toe of the front tires, which effectively just sort of puts, works the front tires a bit more. I, we think, we're pretty sure about this now, it's a device for warming up the front tires and it's manual, or they've managed to convince the FIA and everybody that it's manual, well it is, um, and that's how it's legal. And because the steering allow, the steering rules allow it, even though suspension rules don't, but that's a different matter, it is legal and they can use it to warm up the front tires. It might be that we don't go to all the tracks where front tire warm up is so critical that the DAS would be useful because uh, Andrew Shovlin uh, let this out, mentioned this. He said that we get to some tracks called like Monaco, which isn't happening this year, Canada, which very probably isn't coming happening this year, and Baku, which might not be happening this year, where we really suffer from not having hot enough front tires. And that's where, Shove, Shove didn't say this, but, but this is where we think the DAS will really help, is in the, those tracks where the front tires get cold. And that is a way that Mercedes have found, that's what the DAS does, of effectively putting heat into the front tires so that you've got warm front tires in the sweet spot, you've got warm rear tires in the sweet spot as well, and the car, everything is cushy. So I uh, just thought it was interesting. But DAS is outlawed for next year. It's banned for next year anyway, because the FIA thought it was going to get under, out of control with all the other teams trying it as well. And it looks like the three circuits where it might have been of most value, we might not even go to two of them. So, um, uh, Alf Wiedersehen DAS, DAS end. Is DAS the end of DAS? something like that um it's uh as the team say the benefit of das is still unknown they still need to test it when they get to races after all they were going to test it in melbourne but then melbourne never happened uh that's uh, but we'll see um as for the uh, e racing esteban gutierrez uh, was p2 for mercedes in the latest uh, round of the uh, the uh, sim racing or e racing that was in monaco and stoffel van dorn though their other driver was in, in, embroiled in some controversy. Now, you might think this is odd because Stoffel van Dorn is probably the least likely uh, driver to get embroiled in controversy. He's always been a sort of very mild mannered Belgian chap, hasn't he? Um, not I'm saying anything about Belgians, but Stoffel's been quite mild mannered. No, he uh, immediately after finishing, and uh, uh, Daniel Abt, ABT, the Audi driver, the Audi Formula E driver, was third. Uh, Stoffel said, yes, well, that was all well and good, and so did Jean Eric Verne the uh, double uh, Formula E champion. But Daniel Abt uh, obviously wasn't driving, it was somebody else. Um, and uh, because apparently you couldn't see him on the, uh, on the, 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 the webcam that they have. Uh, and it turned out to be true. 
So uh, Daniel Abd, um, he was ab he, Abd was absent from the whole thing, and uh, they checked the uh, IP addresses and everything, and they found out that Daniel Abd, um, who's very embarrassing for Audi this, because people are taking these uh, virtual races seriously, had brought in a ringer. It was a pro sim racer, an 18-year-old kid called Lorenz Herzing, Lawrence Herzing, a uh, German chap, and um, he was fined 10,000 euros uh, by Formula E and told to give that to a charity of his choice and disqualified from the whole championship, the virtual Formula E championship so far, and has um, gone away in uh, quite a bit of, all right kids, a bit of disgrace because uh, he, uh, well, as Mark Hughes um, from Motorsport Magazine, who works for us and it works for Crofty and Martin in the Country Box, uh, very properly said, um, a pretend, a pretend apt, pretending to be him in a pretend race. So um, <laughs> it's uh, it's it's showing that you know he might have thought because he'd been rubbish. That's the thing. Apt has been absolutely ter absolute absolutely terrible. Sorry, I got a stone in the sandals. Um, uh, Abt had been absolutely terrible up to that point and suddenly he got to Monaco and he was fantastic and on the podium and everybody, well, John Eric Vernon and Stoffel Van Dorn very much smelt a rat uh, and it turned out that uh, he'd brought a ringer in. I just thought it was quite funny, people taking it very seriously. Uh, poor Lawrence Hertzing, didn't get any of the credit. I wonder if he got paid for it. Um, right, Ferrari. We have some interesting things going on uh, at with Charles Leclerc because they have done uh, Le Grand Rendezvous in Monaco, Monaco at dawn. So last weekend was meant to be uh, the Monaco Grand Prix. Of course, it didn't happen. Um, and so instead, now, have you seen a short film? It's about nine minutes. It's by um, a French man called uh, director Claude Lelouch uh, called Le Rendezvous, where uh, a fast car, supposedly a Ferrari, um, goes through the, uh, oh, just keep my distance here, sorry. Um, goes through the streets of Paris doing uh, outrageous speeds, uh, going through red lights and being horribly dangerous, um, supposedly to make a rendezvous with a lady on the steps of uh, Montmartre uh, Cathedral or church. Yeah. Well, they decided to do another one and they called it Le Grand Rendezvous. Um, and it, was, uh, it wasn't a man in... Flares, who was driving this time, it was 1976, the first film, uh, but it was Charles Leclerc looking very dapper. Uh, now, the story about the 1976 one was that, um, and that film was called Cete en Rendezvous, it was a rendezvous, uh, was that it was meant to be filmed in a Ferrari 275 GTB V12, nice car. Now, the story is that the suspension on the Ferrari was so hard, at those speeds, it would have shaken Lelouch's camera equipment to bits, and actually, he used a souped up Mercedes. Uh, C-Class with a, 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 a massive engine to do those speeds and then dubbed the Ferrari sounds with the gearbox and the engine, that glorious V12 engine, more of which we'll talk about in a bit, over the, the, the footage. Of course, the footage was forward facing from the bumper, so you couldn't see what car it was. But a Ferrari was very much used in this version. It was the so Ferrari SF90 Stradale. Uh, and I've got the press release here, it's worth, uh, worth, worth reading. French director Claude Lelouch shot his short film Le Grand Rendezvous in the Principality of Monaco dawn this morning on the very date the Grand Prix was to take place. The French director's cameras accompanied the Ferrari SF90 Stradale as it completed an adrenaline fueled lap of the circuit. Charles Leclerc drove up to 240 kilometers per hour. What's that, 160? Uh, en route to the mystery big date of the title. Oh, I wonder who the uh, big date was with. Um, just go on to page two. Uh, Prince Albert, His Serene Highness Prince Albert of Monaco made also a brief appearance. We should say glad that uh, His Serene Highness is, um, is well again. He had uh, the virus, uh, so he looked well. Uh, at the, uh, the Ferrari chairman, John Elkan, was there as well as some other dignitaries. Uh, thanks to a progressive lifting of the lockdown in France and Monaco, the shoot was also watched by a group of excited onlookers from the balconies and the streets, carefully supervised by the local authorities. Traffic was stopped to allow the SF90 Stradale, which can sprint from 0 to 100 kilometers per hour in 2.5 seconds. Wow. Uh, unleash its full power on the Principality street, streets. The car's blistering engine soundtrack broke a long dry spell for prancing horse enthusiasts and tifosi alike. Most important of all, however, the roar of its hybrid V8, generating a total power of 1,000 horsepower. Wow. Sent out CV, is that horsepower? 
same thing. Um, sent out the message of optimism and signaled a first step towards the return of motorsport, film and social life as we endeavor to put the pandemic behind us through mutually responsible behavior, commitment and solidarity. There you go. Uh, the uh, the uh, Grand Rendezvous premieres on June the 13th next. So uh, I don't know, I think that means next June, June 13th next year. I think it means June 13th coming up in a couple of weeks, although I'll have to edit that quickly, but if it's only nine minutes, I guess it's not uh, gonna be quite so long. So that's what Charles Leclerc has been up to. Now, what has Sebastian, what about Sebastian Vettel? Well, um, he hasn't responded to my uh, suggestion about the, uh, the retro V12 series. Don't know whether he likes the idea uh, or not, but I've been thinking a bit more about it. Um, what do you think? I think it needs to have an H pattern gearbox. That's what I'm kind of stuck on. Does it need to have V12 engines, obviously, uh, or should they be V10s? H pattern gearbox or semi automatic, or at least a, a shift that goes up one, two, three, and then down, bang, 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 bang. I think it kind of needs to have an H pattern gearbox. If it's going to be fully retro, it really needs to have an H pattern gearbox, right? And then people will miss gears and then you'll get overtaken. No halo. I think it has to have no halo. Uh, we'll keep the speeds down so it's not overtly ridiculously uh, dangerous, uh, with, um, which, with much less uh, aero. Maybe we'll have super hard tyres that allow the drivers to, to, to squirm around. That would be quite good. Maybe we'll do that. Anyway, I have been thinking about it, but Seb hasn't got back to me. Something Seb's brother has been doing, Fabian Vettel, has been doing a walk for charity, a walk against cancer, and good for him. Old young Fabian has been doing a lot. And I only mention this because it's worth having a look to see uh, how much Fabian sounds like Sebastian and how some of the mannerisms are absolutely the same between the two drivers. It's just worth watching. So go to Fabian Vettel's Instagram page and have a look and maybe give him a donation. Uh, he's doing um, five days of walking straight uh, for charity. So uh, well done, Fabian. It's just uh, quite amusing to watch how uh, similar the two brothers are. And um, what else? Uh, oh yeah, Alex Albon told him a funny story about Sebastian Vettel, about how um, what a nice guy he was. So they're both going from a tyre test to the Japanese Grand Prix. They were transiting through uh, Charles de Gaulle Airport in Paris. And being in first class, Seb got a, um, a, a BMW a transfer, a car, to pick him up at the uh, plane door from Barcelona to Paris, and then take him straight to the gate for the flight to Tokyo, to Narita. Alex wasn't in first class. He didn't say what class he was in. Um, so didn't get that. But Seb said when he got down to the uh, down the stairs to the car, uh, wait or attendez, I've got a mate back here who's getting the same plane as me with a very tight connection. Can you take him as well? So Alex made his flight to the Japanese Grand Prix this year thanks to Sebastian Vettel. I thought that was a nice story. Um, what else? Oh, the other thing about, um, we'll get on to with the aero freeze, with the aero development freeze, I'll refer to a bit later on with the new rules coming in, it does seem like by Ferrari agreeing to that, they kind of baked in perhaps a disadvantage for themselves for the next couple of years by um, agreeing not to develop the, uh, the car's aerodynamics uh, significantly. So um, that was very good of them uh, to do that. But uh, Carlos Sainz and, and uh, well, I suppose Sebastian Vettel this year and Charles Leclerc might uh, want to think about that uh, a little bit. Right, um, Red Bull. Alex Albon was fourth in the virtual Monaco race that just happened. Um, and so that was pretty good. Max Verstappen doesn't do them still, uh, but uh, he just wants to get racing. So the team tell me he's, uh, it's gonna be a long June, I think for Max Verstappen as we prepare to get racing. Um, and uh, but he's been keeping fit at his home in Monaco. Now the Bottas rumor, I'll just change hands for a sec. Um, now this is that Bottas, could go to Red Bull or is talking to Red Bull. Is it possible? Yes, but I don't see it, you know. I think they're very keen on Alex Albon partnering uh, Max Verstappen, I really do. Uh, the Thai connection helps because Red Bull is 51% owned by the Thai Uvidia family. Um, Alex Albon is Thai, well, he's London-born Thai driver, but you know what I mean. And I don't see that Bottas would do anything particularly that Albon can't do. So I think while it's um, uh, true that uh, 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 Bottas is obviously talking to Red Bull and Red Bull are probably talking to, to his representatives. I can't really see that one happening. I don't think it makes sense uh, for either party, but you can understand, as I said earlier, why Bottas is looking at it because um, he has to protect himself. Now, McLaren, they'll be glad of the budget cap. Uh, budget cap is coming in 
uh, which is going to be 145. Zach Brown didn't get the 130, 120 million uh, dollar budget cap he wanted just yet. He's going to get it, it seems, in 2022 and 2023. So uh, I'll tell you the details later. Into, sorry, 23, 24, 25, it will go down to 135 uh, million US dollars. So um, by with which time you would say McLaren will be on the way up with Mercedes engines. So it might be perfect timing for McLaren to hit that budget cap lower that they wanted. So it's a level financial playing field for everybody as McLaren go up in competitiveness, having had a few years uh, getting themselves out of uh, uh, the, the mess that they've been in for the last few years post Honda connection. But um, what else has been going on? Uh, well, McLaren need the budget cap. No wonder Zach Brown was so keen on it. McLaren need the budget cap uh, as much as anybody else. Of course, remember, uh, they were the first ones to put their uh, staff on furlough, which was followed by pretty much every other uh, Formula One team. And the car uh, division isn't selling any cars at the moment because um, people aren't allowed to drive. Well, we're told people aren't allowed to drive. Some people aren't allowed to drive, some are, um, it seems. And uh, that's why the car division is, uh, is, is, is really hurting at the moment. So McLaren really need that all uh, to come in. Um, Carlos Sainz did an interview with uh, my colleagues at F1.com with Will Buxton. And he said that uh, Ferrari approached him over the winter. He wouldn't specify when. Sometime between the end of last year, end of 2019, and when they did the deal. So it looks like they had uh, thought about a plan B quite early in case Sebastian didn't turn, Sebastian Vettel didn't uh, work out, which indeed it didn't. Um, that was one interesting thing from that. And then he's very excited, is science about the Ferrari move. He's thinking already about how he might test the car, whether there's going to be any testing over the winter of 2020, 2021. Probably not, because we're going to have such a late end to the season. He's going to have to learn about all the new procedures. And I wondered whether he's going to move to Bologna or to Maranello, because at the moment he talked about, you know, how important he's found it to be to be close to the McLaren factory. And I wonder whether he's going to uh, up sticks from Woking. Why would anyone do that? Lovely place to live uh, and actually move to Italy or maybe move to be to be with Charles Leclerc in Monaco. Presumably he's going to earn quite a bit more from Ferrari than he was uh, at uh, McLaren is science. And um, maybe he'll go to Monaco and then drive the, what is it, four and a half hours from Monaco to, uh, to Maranello. But um, I like the idea of him living uh, down the road in uh, Bologna or Modena or somewhere like that. But um, what else was he was saying in this video that uh, he did with F1.com? He was saying about how uh, great Zach Brown and Andreas Seidel were about, about him moving and how supportive they were, which kind of surprised me. I guess it's the new McLaren, isn't it? It's the new midfield McLaren. You wouldn't have had Ron Dennis being all nice about um, Kimi Raikkonen going to Ferrari. In fact, I remember he was spitting blood about it. He was very angry about it, but um, he was getting uh, uh, Fernando Alonso in, I suppose, when Kimi left to go to Ferrari. But uh, yeah, anyway, well, I suppose that was nice of Zach Brown and Andreas Seidel to be um, to be supportive rather than stand in their way. I guess they couldn't stand in Carlos Sainz's way, uh, given that uh, a big team had come in for him. Um, Natalie's done a great piece with Lando Norris about his uh, F1 crib, so check that out on uh, all of our channels and uh, on the TV, it's good fun. Um, but uh, he did a good little post on social media where he saw a squirrel outside his house, Lando Norris, and he said um, it's the only human contact or um, furry contact he's had uh, all, uh, all week and it's his friend and he's going to call him Carlos. So uh, Carlos the squirrel, he might some, leave some nuts out. Lando might leave some nuts out for um, Carlos uh, the squirrel. Um, anything I was, else was saying? Uh, uh, Arthur Leclerc, oh yeah, he made a little Lando, did a little um, move on Arthur Leclerc in the, uh, in the, in the sim race, which um, it was a little bit of a, a mistake. Now, Renault, how long have we done? Oh goodness. Um, you might have heard quite a lot about this. Uh, Renault, the, the French finance minister, did a, a radio interview where he said Renault might not exist in the future. I think he was just talking rhetorically. I don't think he really means that Renault isn't going to exist in the future. He was just saying in you know, a French way, well, yes, it might not exist, but I think it will exist. The French government wouldn't let that happen, so don't worry about it. Um, whether that five billion euro uh, fund that the French finance minister is going to approve for Renault, the car maker, is going to extend to keeping the uh, F1 team in business remains to be seen. But with the uh, with the rule changes coming in to uh, drop the cost of uh, owning uh, and running a Formula One team coming in, 
it makes it more attractive if somebody else, another billionaire, whoever it is, wants to buy Enstone as a team off Renault and take it on as a going concern. The idea is with this incoming, uh, all the new rules and the budget cap, is that owning a Formula One team, running a Formula One team, will be break even at the very worst and profit making uh, at best. So um, hopefully, uh, I'm sure they will con continue. Um, the, uh, the, the cut costs, the, the cost caps will help the team, Cyril Abit Bull said. And um, something that won't help Esteban Ocon is the um, computer connection between the uh, Renault showroom on the Champs Elysees. It's such a sad story. This has absolutely broke my heart. All right, Esteban Ocon is just can't get a break at the moment. He's desperate to get racing. And Renault thought they'd do for the Monaco Grand Prix this great little PR exercise where they got Ocon into Paris to the Atelier Renault, which is on the Champs Elysees. Uh, if you've been there, it's very nice. If you haven't go, it's really nice. You go, they've got some um, Renault Twingo and some old Renaults, and you can go and try your luck at a, a pit stop changing competition. You know, that kind of thing. Anyway, it's good. So Esteban got in there, was going to do the Monaco Grand Prix from there, and then the computer crashed. Couldn't do qualifying, couldn't do the race, had to apologize to everybody for... Um, for getting them there. I assume they had them there um, in masks or two meters distant. Um, and um, the whole thing just never happened. It, it n'existed pas. Uh, so that was really, uh, really sad. I just feel sorry. Kind of sums up Ocon's season uh, a little bit. Um, is Alonso coming back to Renault? Very possibly, depending on who you listen to. Uh, will he wait and see if Renault survive before he makes a commitment? Probably that would be sensible. But Bottas's people also talking to Renault and Cyril Abitbull as well. Um, right, we'll run through the rest of the teams very quickly. Alpha Tauri, uh, the new aero handicap, which I'll tell you about in a second, could actually help Alpha Tauri because they do make their own wings and aero in their, from their wind tunnel in Bista, so that could really help them. Racing Point, Aston Martin, um, what effect would the aero development handicap have on Racing Point who don't actually develop their aero. They just, well, certainly this year, they've copied Mercedes. Um, it would probably hurt them because um, they're not really in control, it seems, at the moment of their own aero. They've taken the Mercedes part, but I guess they can develop all their own stuff themselves. So um, maybe it won't have an effect on, uh, on Racing Point uh, at all, but uh, we will see. Um, have Aston Martin, has Lawrence Stroll made Sebastian Vettel an offer to be an Aston Martin uh, uh, ambassador for the future. I could see it, but why would Seb, Seb wouldn't race for them at the moment. And anyway, uh, Lance Stroll, I think you could say is safe in that seat. And Sergio Perez has a contract and does bring money to the team. So they'd have to buy him out of that. I guess they could do that. But um, I think that's maybe a step too far. Although Gunter Steiner on the, uh, on the, the vodcast, no, it was the uh, F1 show on Sky uh, yesterday on Monday, said that someone with deeper pockets than him is going to come in for Sebastian Vettel. Well, I suppose Lawrence Stroll has deeper pockets than him. But Lawrence Stroll is doing some action in, uh, in his Aston Martin road car division as well. Seems like Andy Palmer, who's a real racer, who was the CEO of Aston Martin, who signed up for the uh, title sponsorship with Red Bull Racing and started the Valkyrie uh, project, the supercar project with Adrian Newey and Red Bull Technologies, isn't going to be with Aston Martin for too long. The FT has reported that uh, he's going to be replaced as CEO by AMG boss Tobias Moers. Uh, so not going to be replaced by Toto Wolff, but someone else from Mercedes, the AMG division of Mercedes, Tobias Moers, is going to be the new uh, boss of um, Aston Martin, so say the FT. The FT also reported that uh, Andy Palmer hadn't been told about this, and the first he learned about it was when the FT called him to ask him for some comment about it. Walks, a bit of walks from that. But um, yeah, we will see um, whether Lawrence Stroll decides to take a different direction from what Andy Palmer was doing uh, with the, the Valkyrie hypercar project. Just keep the two meters here, there we go. Uh, from the hypercar uh, project and uh, whether just to what wants Aston Martin as the car company just to concentrate on the cars, if you see what I mean. Alfa Romeo Sauber, poor Antonio Giovinazzi. He had a virtual crash at the start of the virtual Monaco Grand Prix and uh, left the game quite quickly. Um, and um, uh, Kimi Raikkonen has been celebrating the third birthday of his daughter, Rihanna. So should we say happy birthday, Rihanna, uh, Kimi's daughter, three years old. Wow, doesn't time fly? 
But we should also say um, the Alfa Romeo Sauber test driver, Juan Manuel Correa, you remember him, he was involved in the horrific uh, crash which killed Antoine Hubert at Spa-Francorchamps last year. Correa um, was in a coma, almost lost his life, almost lost his right leg but has been rebuilding uh, his strength, has been rebuilding his right leg as well. They've managed to save it and um, has been exercising and is back doing sim racing. Fantastic story and has been doing pretty well. I think he was 12th in uh, the Monaco, virtual Monaco Grand Prix. So um, just a brilliant story. Well done, Juan Manuel Correa. Great to see him uh, back and uh, virtually driving once again. Um, Haas F1. Gunter Steiner saying the new framework uh, for F1's finances are making F1 more equal and it helps that teams will be able to break even. Uh, as I said, he's not offering Seba Drive, but thinking thinks that somebody will will do it. Uh, but um, we think and we think Haas are one of the teams whose uh, team, whose mechanics and everyone are going to be unfurloughed. Uh, next week, as are Williams, which say congratulations, George Russell. He's a double winner in the esports. He won the virtual Monaco Grand Prix uh, last weekend. He's learning juggling to stay sharp. He told us uh, on the TV, and um, he dominated the race. He overtook, uh, he took Pietro Fittipaldi off the line and beat Esteban Gutierrez by 39 seconds at the end to win back-to-back esports races. Does this have an effect? on what people think of him, I think it does. I think if you're doing well in sim racing, people do think that you're, um, that you're, uh, you know, you're, you're keeping with it and that you've got skills with a Z. Um, and Williams, I think, are gonna love the aero handicap because they still make, they have their own wind tunnel, uh, whereas some of the virtual teams like Haas don't have their own wind tunnel. Um, and they can take, they've got their own model shop. And if they finish lower in the constructors, uh, championship, then they get more time in the wind tunnel and uh, in CFD than people who are world champions. So I think Williams are really going to benefit from that. So that kind of touches on all the teams. That is all the uh, uh, the new rules and regulations and the, 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 the which you've probably already guessed what they are by now. So to make F1 more sustainable, they've got the budget cap coming in, 145 US dollars uh, for this year and for next. Sorry, for, for 100, it goes down to 140 in 2022, 135 in 2023 and 2024 and 2025. That's how they make it sustainable. How they make it more uh, competitive is that for the first time, we are going to have a handicap system in Formula One. So success will not be rewarded. At the moment, you get 60 hours of wind tunnel time per week. And if you the so the the world champions in 2020 that will go down to from 60 hours to 54 hours that's that's 90 percent while the last person in the championship will get time added uh to their uh time allowed in wind tunnels so they'll be allowed 67 and a half hours now that might not sound an extra seven hours uh, for the for the lowest place team who are currently Williams and six hours less for the top place team which is kind of Mercedes you might not think that sounds much it's not going to make a huge dent in Mercedes championship um, competitiveness but in the years to come in 2022 the top the world champions will only get 42 hours in wind tunnels rather than 60 while the last place team will get 69 hours so there is really a penalty for success for the first time in Formula One there is like the best horse getting lead added to his saddle to slow him down in a handicap race. There seems to be a penalty for success and there'll be big discussions as to whether that's something that Formula One or Route Formula One should be going down. Right, we've uh, done our time. Um, I've got lots more to say about uh, how the, uh, the uh, engine restrictions, uh, dyno time, the race format coming in, what's happening with the calendar as well. Um, but we will save that for next week's notebook. So um, for my evening walk, might as well wrap it up because it's getting quite, uh, quite dark here. Uh, I'll say thanks very much for watching and um, well, we'll have more to look forward to next week. Bye-bye. Sky Sports F1. Feel it all.